Um, and I think I just gonna, yeah, I can start sharing my screen here and get that up and then I'll just uh, make a few comments uh, as we go along here. Um, so just, I'm not one of these guys that can talk and chew bubble gum at the same time. So I think once that's up, then we're good to go. All right, so, um, so thank you again for uh, providing time for me to, to speak. And I've, I heard that yesterday's event was really well received and, and I hope that uh, it's a good opportunity for reflection this afternoon as well. And that overall that the, uh, the meeting, um, you know, feeds your soul and sustains you in the ministry and, and, and inspires you to continue the good work and supporting the people uh, who as Blake, offered in prayer or serving at the front lines. So I, um, you can see in the title of my talk, I have uh, a reference to journey and it really has been a journey just getting here. I think um, it was about two years ago that Blake reached out to me and asked if I could speak at the conference. And then the conference was delayed, of course, with pandemic. And, and of course, now it's in a virtual format. I do know uh, that even prior to that, there was uh, um, an opportunity to speak at a previous uh, Catholic Health Association of Saskatchewan uh, conference in years past, but there was always a kind of a conflict. So I'm finally here uh, in virtual format, but it's a, a pleasure. And in my title too, I, I, um, I make reference to seeing and embracing mission as journey, and I'll, I'll unpack that. But I I, um, I want to also reference the, the title of the conference around um, seeing our mission clearly. So I would just suggest at this point that seeing is one, is one aspect, but it's once we see in uh, what might that entail in terms of a response, in terms of um, in recognizing need, for example, and then how we might uh, take risks to, um, to embrace that call and, um, and then when that call might be challenging, which sustains us in that journey. So that's essentially what I would sort of like to unpack here. And so the word journey in itself is interesting. Um, and in one, in one sense, it, you know, it, it entails this sense of moving from one place to another, moving from here to there. And, and that's at a physical level. And, and we know there's no geographical cures because another word, another saying comes to mind and that being wherever you go, there you are. Uh, my sister uh, right now, I, she lives in interior BC and I think year after year, is just so tired of the fires and the smoke. And so they wanna move to, to the island. And but she also is very wise to know that, you know, wherever you go, there you are, that some of the things that you um, that you might, um, you know, maybe, you know, just aware of or struggling with, it's still going to be there no matter where you live. And so um, that to me uh, really uh, suggests that we have to pay attention to the interior elements of journey. And when it comes to mission and, and our response to mission, to be aware of who we are as leaders, and uh, I won't have this opportunity to know all what you do and what how you support the ministry. But as we are remain faithful and you know responding to the, the great call of Catholic healthcare and the, and the, and the mission uh, uh, which we support, uh, we need to pay attention to some of the interior elements and what may be going on for us and where uh, our ability to see may be occluded at times or when we do see, but our ability to respond courageously and fully may be hindered in some respect. And so that sense of journey is, is both a, um, a physical or a tangible uh, has a tangible dimension, but it also has a intangible dimension. And so I, I like to kind of just keep that before us as I go. And, and, my, and my reflection is going to be really, um, or my presentation is going to have some of those reflective elements. So the other thing that I like to just point out is that because this really does entail us reflecting on who we are uh, and how we locate ourselves in our call to, to mission, um, that and it really kind of ex 
it requires us to think about our leadership. I just want to point out, uh, you know, it's obvious, uh, and I'll just use myself as a test case. No one is perfect. We all are um, a life project, so to speak. And like this tree here, you know, it may be pulled up, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, to, by the sunlight and, and growing, but it doesn't grow evenly. And like us as leaders in, in our work and mission, uh, we will have uh, setbacks and we'll have twists and turns. And, and, and that's fine. And that's just part of life. Um, and what I really, um, what I feel is more fundamentally important is not perfection, but just being authentic, being authentic to the call and recognizing that uh, we have to own our experience, that our experience shapes what we see and will shape what we, how we respond. And, and I'll unpack that again further when we start talking about compassion. And, and because we're not perfect and because we're called to be authentic, there, there is a, a dimension of just being humble. And, and humility in the truest sense about being not down, you know, downcast and in the, in the sense of, you know, playing small, but just being uh, honest about our limitations and, uh, and where our ability to, um, you know, our journey with mission requires us to partner with others because we can't do it all. And through COVID, we've seen in, in, in spades where many limitations and the demands of the ministry uh, can be exceedingly uh, challenging. And, and so we need to sort of just inculcate that attitude of humility and recognizing that, um, you know, when Jesus called his disciples to, to ministry, we just know they were a motley crew and we're you know, at least again, I'll speak for myself, I'm no different in the sense of sometimes we, we get it and sometimes we don't. Sometimes our response is, is fulsome and um, impactful. And other times we may question ourselves. Uh, Blake made reference to um, some of my hobby work and, and because I just, I'm a visual learner and I find stories uh, an engaging way to sort of reflect on ministry, I am um, in one of my novels, I, you know, a, a physician's talking to a, a physician learner and, and just points out that, you know, good doctors know all there is, but a great doctor knows there's still more to learn. And I think you can swap out doctor and put in leader, mission leader, or administrator, or clinician, um, husband, wife, friend. Um, and there, there's lots to learn about ourselves and about one another. And, um, and so I think, again, leadership is seldom a straight line and our work in ministry will take many surprising turns along the way. So um, I just wanted to sort of, for my focus of the presentation today, just focus on foundational elements that shape me and my understanding of ministry. I'm just gonna minimize this. So, um, um, well, maybe I'll throw me up there so you can see where, um there sorry folks just playing around with things here anyways so I'll, I'll just put that over there and then just so it doesn't block the the presentation slides but i'd like to kind of focus on three elements that have shaped my call to ministry and um just gotta go back on the screen here and i can and i will unpack all of these in turn i'm not a photographer but just so you know that all these pictures were kind of just something that pictures that I took on a trip to Vancouver Island and you might recognize some of these places as we go along. The first is compassion and um, and it begins with um, um, a sense of what compassion maybe isn't. And I like to suggest that sympathy, you know, sometimes we might tend to use these in, in, in everyday usage um, kind of interchangeably. But I think all of, I think it's fair to say that sympathy is, uh, is, is qualitatively different than what I would understand compassion to be. Compassion draws from the root word come, meaning with or together and passio suffering or, 
or submission. So being like one in suffering. And um, whereas I think sympathy, and as I just reflect on some of my background and experience, I used to work as an orderly once upon a time over 40 years ago when I started in Catholic healthcare and then then um, then became a chaplain for a number of years and then uh, then working in ethics and then in administration, et cetera. But as I reflect back on my clinical experience, I see compassion as very, very different. And, um, and, in, and in fact, a sympathetic response really in some respects uh, at times, at least in my own experience, is kind of really akin to a, a revulsion where I, I feel sorry for somebody, but parenthetically, it, it almost means like, I don't want to be like them. I, I um, you know, there's an aversion to get too close to something. And I remember one particular day working and I used to do work in ICUs as a chaplain and, and it was one of these terrible days where, you know, I worked in two ICUs at this one hospital and we had a really difficult case in the morning and then a difficult case in the afternoon. And mid, mid sometime during that day, I got in the elevator and, you know, it wasn't uh, uh, confidential disclosure, but I could hear the nurses who I knew kind of referring to how difficult the day was. And one of them said, we had to push it down just to get through the day. And there's times there were the, the pain that we see, the trauma that we experience, even vicariously, is too hard to look at, too hard to see. So that's not the kind of meaning that I would understand if it's compassion. I, but compassion, um, uh, I think, you know, you know, and uh, if you're a movie buff or a uh, uh, in, you know, enjoy good re- literature. Uh, I think of Somerset Mom's classic of human bondage. And so the physician, the character named Carrie Phillips, um, he, Carrie Phillip, he, he has a club foot and there's one scene both in the book and then some of the movie renditions where he, you know, meets a boy who in, in, in the, in the, in the, um, in a clinic setting and, who also has a club foot. And there's times where we see in another the pain that's within ourselves. And it's because we have a pain that we carry, a club foot, so to speak. We all have some affirmity or some defect in character or some illness or challenge in our lives. And because we've attended to that, we can recognize and see that in another, and that creates a sense of bonding. And I'm, and I'm not talking about projecting our our needs onto a vulnerable patient. Uh, there's a saying, and you know, like day one in chaplain school, you know, it's okay to cry with your patients, just don't cry louder than them. And um, and so we don't. There's no place, you know, as Henry Nouwen talks in his classic of you know the wounded healer about a gaping wound that, that we spill all over people. But when we are able to um, see it and recognize it in humility, that opens our eyes and helps us to respond with that same, uh, at the same place in the same, you know, where we can bend down and, and um, as in Somerset Mom's classic, where you can see a patient, uh, see a, another person before you, at the same level with that deeper sense of understanding. I, and that, to be able to do that, and this comes back to humility, it will entail vulnerability. And, um, you know, we've done a lot of work over the years around emergency contraception from time to time that becomes something that we need to step back and reflect on and, and understand our experience. And I, and I remember uh, in a wonderful story or article in Health Progress, a physician who's uh, who works in emergency, you know, veteran physician, has seen everything, has tended to, she talks about tending to gunshot wounds and stabbings and seeing such tragedy, uh, you know, motor vehicle accident victims, et cetera. But she said in this article that when I'm before a person who's been sexually assaulted, there's no place to hide. And there's something about that egregious, just despicable sort of assault on another human being, um, whether it's a woman or a man or a child, that just for her and I think for all of us can identify 
um, it's just such a, a, a wound that it's hard to see and you can't hide. There is no place for that sympathetic revulsion. It just touches a place within all of us. So there, it will entail a vulnerability, our ability to see fully the wound in another at times may expose us. And, and I just, again, I like telling stories. So just I'll try to be sensitive to the time here, but a couple of stories that have stood out in my in my, in my uh, vocation over these last 40 or so years. And one goes back and I can remember it like it was yesterday. Um, and it was on a summer night um, in July, probably about 1982 or 83 on a, on a, on a Saturday, eve, Saturday night. And there's a patient, um, and I'll try to, you know, not to belabor the point too much, but very patient in deep, deep pain. Um, and, and he was dying and his wife was exhausted. And I, I, I was an orderly back in the days when we, they were called orderlies. And I told his wife that just go home and rest. I'll look after your husband. And this man, just because of his own pride and he, um, was incontinent of stool and he would, he would struggle, like literally struggle, um, to go to the bathroom, uh, in his room and back and I would help him. He was a big man and I can still feel his weight leaning on me. And in, in some respects, I felt like Simon of Cyrene, you know, caring or helping to help Jesus and carrying his cross. And, and this man, you know, and he was on a palliative unit, but back in the day, and, and even to this day, there are still times where uh, it's difficult, you know, some, it's hard to manage people's pain and symptom uh, manage your symptoms. And this gentleman early in these days in the palliative work, um, I think just we could not get on top of this man's pain. And this man was writhing in agony. And sometimes we made it to the bathroom and back. And sometimes we didn't. But as I cared for that man um, and feeling his weight on me, it left an impression. Um, it touched me. And I, I've never forgotten that. And I And to this day, I think about him um, and I think about uh, what it meant to shoulder somebody somebody's pain and and I felt like it was like as I said like um, you know uh, being with Christ but as I reflect on it too I, I felt you know being Christ-like to him as well so that's one story another story that I, I'm not as proud of but it was a very difficult time in an emergency department, motor vehicle accident, a whole family got killed just before Christmas, terrible, slippery roads. Another car lost control, T-bone this car with two, you know, a mom and dad and their two young children. And, and the dad and the, and the son came to our hospital, the mom and, or pardon me, the mom and the daughter came to our hospital and the dad and the, and the boy went to another hospital. And uh, I probably, I, I probably of all the things that I've seen, I, I would I, I think that I had some post-traumatic stress from this experience, but what, um, and not to get into all the graphic details, but the, what I, I was there that night and fa other families came in and there was viewings, et cetera, all that stuff, trying to support the staff. But the thing that I felt um, that I could not go to was the car that, you know, accidentally, uh, T-bone the the um, this other vehicle that you know and left all these casualties. They also were wounded and were in in the hospital, and I can still see them in the other part of the stretcher bay. And I I wish that I had just pulled myself away for a few minutes just to acknowledge what they were going through, and you know they had you know it was actually the car that everybody died that lost control and then they slammed into the other incoming car. So there was no, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, charges laid against this, this other uh, couple, but they also were victims in this process, but I just felt I could not go there in that moment. And so what I like to say is that like in the tradition of Veronica, who, who you know, whose uh, veil Jesus, uh, face was imprinted on there are things that we experience in our work and mission that will leave an impression on us that will endure 
and can have impact and what we can what we tend to see going forward and what we might still find ourselves struggling to to um, give our attention to or give our fullness of our heart to so i just wanted to sort of offer those two stories so um there are times when in compassion that it calls us to uh bear witness to um to the needs of others and unlike sympathy which were as i suggest you know may sort of reveal some a bit of a revulsion or inability to go there compassion moves us towards another um it, it's a uh, it, it it prompts us or pushes us uh compels us to connect and to and but when we step out of ourselves and we and we are able to do so it, it exposes us in some respects and i remember you know again these are just like little vignettes i'll throw them out here but you know uh when we first formed covenant and i've been with it since its inception so um you know we had this early team building with amongst our executive and we were just talking about some issues but you know sometimes when you know we all have our uh we can all let our hair down in certain safe vents and that's necessary and important we all have you know i need to do that and so does the senior executive team but our conversation got a little careless and, and um and the way we just started talking about people as if they were commodities or you know again i don't want to you know imply that we we're uh, heartless but sometimes when you just start talking in a way where you know people um you know we wouldn't normally talk that way and i just felt like you know we were kind of crossing a line there and and i'm not you know i do it i can do that as like anybody else i'm just as guilty so i didn't want to be on my high horse but i did stand up and i just said that we need to sort of be careful but i was shaking in my boots when i did that um you know and again i wasn't trying to say that everybody was like you know acting um in, in an unbecoming way and and i was pure and innocent i was part of this as well but i felt like it needed to be call, called out mm -hmm. And to call out something does take courage. Mm -hmm. uh, I suggest here that it's, you know, sometimes we talk about compassion being this soft, you know, virtue, or, you know, when we look at our value statements, we might have, you know, uh, stewardship is kind of like something that we can all kind of wrap our heads around and, you know, can, you know, because it's all about money and resources and we can touch it and we can manage it and control it. But co compassion is kind of like one of those soft virtues, and and I like to say that compassion is is actually a, a very to to really live with that authentic commitment to being a compassionate person, uh, and to be a compassionate organization, and to um, and to to live out of our mission with that from a place of compassion is not a soft competence. All it takes takes courage, which moves me to another foundational element and again this is from um i think i took this picture at the uh, bouchard gardens but um you know uh, uh, um and when you see you know rugged trees old growth force um you know there's a sense of permanence a sense of how rooted these trees are and the and the um you know, I've walked into polls before, uh, and I'm sure when I die one day, if they ever did a post-mortem, they'd see all these head injuries in my skull. Uh, one of these days, I'm going to have to start wearing a football helmet to work, but I have not yet walked into a tree, not that I'm, you know, wanting to add up to my repertoire, but if I ever did, the tree would win, um, most definitely. And so there's a sense of the strength to courage but courage is not this sort of reckless abandon and uh if you've ever read Ro moby dick and you know what captain a habit that recklessness that you know um you know uh, unbridled passion at times uh can lead to your own destruction and so i i would not suggest courage in that sense of uh of uh an exercise of courage looking like that but rather more with from the cardinal virtue of fortitude, that, that sense of, as I, as I, you know, as I see reflected in this tree here, a sense of strength that's rooted in, in a in a depth of character, 
uh, rooted in life experience, rooted in a sense of from a place of, of spirit or soul. And, you know, the Misericordia Sisters, who are one of our founding congregations, in, in their um, coat of arms, uh, they have depicted the oak leaf because they uh, have laid claim to this charism of, uh, they reflect, refer to it as audacity, the strength of, of being, um, you know, bringing a strength to their ministry um, and not being uh, afraid to uh, speak out and, st and stand in solidarity with those in, 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 in their tradition and caring for uh, unwed mothers, you know, and uh, who themselves very vulnerable. And so the sense of strength or audacity, and for me, it's not about strength for its own sake, but strength for someone. Uh, an exercise of strength on behalf of others. And that becomes more obvious when we start just thinking about demonstrations of courage. And we can probably all think, and for all the parents out there, what you've done for your kids and at times what you might have had to do that at great personal cost. Um, uh, or, um, you know, if there was ever a time that your child was in danger or threatened, or if somebody was, you know, um, you know, intending to do harm to your children, what a parent would do, it, it would surprise all of us if we we're ever in that position. Um, and that's one thing when it's our children, but when we see such acts of courage on behalf of a stranger, that's even more compelling because there's no emotional commitment and so in that moment there's a choice that's made and again it may be all sort of at a level of unconsciousness or just you're just prompted beyond yourself later on you might reflect how did I do that and um, you know I remember gosh it's probably about 45 years ago or longer I was like a teenager and and um, reading a story about this kid in Ireland who um, there was a fire at a dance and and you know people were being overwhelmed and you know he this it was all reported how this other team just went in and out bringing out victims until one day he one time he didn't uh, return at all he he, he eventually was uh, um, you know uh, killed himself and I always remember that and I'm not suggesting I'm some hero or whatever like that but I think about um, those touch stone touch tone experiences in my life about when you see that type of action it prompts me when I think about our own ministry and our own setting about what we're prepared to do on behalf of another uh, again I'll just throw these stories out here just to kind of give you a visual idea sense of what I'm talking about. There's a, 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 a friends of ours, uh, their dad had a very difficult palate of journey himself. And, and um, at his funeral, finally, after Steve died, and, uh, and struggled. And again, another one of those times where, you know, uh, we, we might, you know, there's times where we just struggle with some of our pain and symptom management. And Steve uh, was one such individual. And uh, I, I noticed during my time caring, for, visiting the family and being there with Steve, uh, that the crucifix, he was in the Catholic hospital, but the crucifix above his bed, the, the corpus, the, you know, Jesus was not on the on the um, probably fell off or whatever but the the cross was still up on on the wall and the priest though at his funeral talked about that he noticed that as well and he talked about you know jesus wasn't on the wall jesus was in the bed and and for me i'm old school it's always about the patient it's always about the resident the person in the bed that's why we are in catholic health care and all of us have to find some rec some connection to that person, um, to, to the Christ uh, in that bed. Um, and, and again, for the interest of time, I won't refer to this other uh, poem and all that. Uh, but, but, you know, but suffice to say that we need to think about what will move us, what will, what will, how will we uh, live out of that place of courage and for whom? 
And so that kind of brings me to uh, probably, I think it's one of the best midlife parodies of all time and, you know, wonderful story, City Slickers. But if you know the story, Billy Crystal's kind of going through a midlife crisis and goes on this uh, cattle drive, you know, you know, kind of want to be kind of cowboy. And long story short, he, he, you know, he figures out from the Jack Plants character that you got to stand up for something and, and, um, and, and, and not, it's about not who you, you know, um, you know, basically it's, it's understanding about, you know, what is the one thing that you will give your life to and your heart to. And, um, and in my own kind of writings and reflections, I, I often think of midlife is, uh, this transition from early in your life when you're trying to establish career and family and all that, uh, you move from that sort of exploration of self-identity about who I am um, to whose I am, to whom do I belong, to whom do I give my heart or that poem I reference about what will break your heart, what will move you to get out of bed in the morning and, and, how you allocate your time and energy. And so for Norm or for um, Billy Crystal here, and if you haven't seen the movie, you know, not to give it away, but, you know, basically Norm and the cow kind of suggest something for him, but we all have to kind of find what that might be. And I say this because having been in Catholic health for a long time and going back to that gnarled tree, we can lose sight. We can forget. We can, um, it can get beaten, compassion can get beaten out of us, our courage can wane, we can uh, find ourselves um, um, just, um, you know, just losing direction. And, um, and so there's times where we need to remember about what is that we're going to say yes to. And um, I, I often in my teaching, I use a lot of marriage examples or family examples, because it's pretty accessible. So it's not just yes that you say at the altar, you know, um, you know, it's how you say yes to your spouse every day of your life and at times sacrifice in terms of, you know, um, you know, checking your ego, um, putting the needs of others before yourself, that sort of thing. So that sense about yes. And again, to go back to um, uh, our ministry and frame it in that, that, uh, to say yes and you know what what gets you what keeps you in healthcare and um, so anyways I like to um, uh, in my writing I, I it's amazing if any of you've published things or um, you, know, you know whatever you're you're a musician and you get up on a stage or whatever a public speaker there's there's going to be a certain exposure that goes with that. And when I wrote my first novel, I didn't realize that until after it was, it came out It's self published. So again, I don't make any money at these things. It's just like a hobby, but nonetheless, you know, just giving it to friends and families, copies and all that. It's like, suddenly I realized, what did I do? I, now people are going to read these stories and, and even though it's fiction, it's all inspired by your reflections on life and little things that you encounter. And it's all part of the incubator for like good creative drama and, um, and fiction and all that. And so I was asked to, um, so I've gotten more comfortable with that. And some years back, um, I was asked to give a talk at, at, at Catholic Social Services. And if you're interested, you know, the links there, and, and I can share these slides after with Blake and I'm fine if you want to take them, but I'll, I'll give you the short version here. And I apologize for this graphic image. Uh, it's an image that um, many of you would remember. Um, but this was one of these experiences earlier in my life at a time when I was probably in a, in a messed up space in my late teens. And, and so during the Vietnam war, this image was, you know, broadcast throughout the world. And, and, and it, it is graphic in its, um, in its, in its visual. And I should have prepared you. I, I, I should have, sometimes I do that and I just forgot here. So I, I apologize if it was a pretty graphic transition, but um, this has really shaped my ministry in a sense that at times there would be decisions or uh, events that, you know, we're part of that we, um, you know, we, we may play a role in, 
you know, um, in terms of having, you know, decisions that we make at, at a senior leadership level within Catholic healthcare. Um, and those decisions, you know, you know, like here, the, you know, they're, they're the superpowers who are at war in a, in a country, um, but there is casualties. There are, there's collateral damage, so to speak. There are innocent victims that, that may be impacted by these decisions. So that's always has shaped me. And uh, so naive 17 or 18 year old, um, I uh, saw this at that time. And, uh, and I felt like, okay, I can't do anything about these kids here, but maybe I can help somebody else. So in 1979, at the height of the, or the, maybe the beginning of the boat people crisis, this family, the Leong family, um, immigrated to Winnipeg, where I was living at the time, and I befriended them. And, um, and again, I don't want to sound like a hero. I was kind of like Robin Hood. I took from my parents' house and gave to the family. So it wasn't like it was... My parents probably like, where did that TV go? And, oh, I took it over to the Leon family, but uh, I befriended them, and um, and they had nothing, but uh, Mrs. Leon could cook, and I was like a starving, you know, seventeen-year-old, so to speak. And I brought things to my parents' house. They fed me. I brought them things, and and you know. You know these kids they saw their first Walt Disney movie and stuff like that and you know took them on boat rides and and just helped this family out and I played a small part well if you've lived in Vietnam and you moved to Winnipeg you're probably only going to spend a couple winters there before you realize there's got to be a better place to live in Canada so they ended up living in Vancouver and so for a while there I you know lost for many many years actually I lost touch with them and then um, then, then one day on the left is Diem, and Diem was just a baby at the time. Um, and in fact, I remember one day when the family were young, uh, Kui, the Mr. Leong, um, no, actually it was two, the tall daughter there. Um, she contacted me and she says, she, asked, she says, my dad asked if you can bring us to the hospital because mom's having a baby. And I'm thinking, she's having a baby. I didn't know she was pregnant. Uh, again, 17 year old kind of like, you know, just clueless, you know, and I guess she was very petite and I couldn't tell that she was pregnant. I didn't even realize that. So I brought um, the kids over to the family and, and because, oh, pardon me, because Dim on the left here um, was born. Fast forward, she was getting married and she was kind of like wondering about this, uh, the stories that she never really knew me. I never knew her, but her sisters, Trang here in the middle and two on the, on the right, um, they would, they talked about this guy that kind of befriended them and for a couple of years before they moved away. And, uh, so she's in the day of the internet, you just look up somebody's name and, you know, and if you do any kind of Prof, like if you're in a public context, like in healthcare, or whatever, like that, you're, it's not that hard. And so she reached out and, you know, I remember kind of, it brought tears to my eyes that morning uh, when I read that email. And so we reconnected and this is, I caught up with them in, in Vancouver. And, and um, so, you know, you can see, I don't have a lot of hair, but when I was 17, I, I, you know, had a, a, a bit of hair there, as you can see, and these, uh, this is an old picture at the time that I was befriending them. And as I kind of reflect on that story, what you don't see in this picture here is perhaps um, if you take a close look, you might see a kid that was in trouble. And uh, I was on a, on a fast track to um, probably a gutter. I was pretty messed up got involved with drugs at the time, quit school. And at the time, um, I thought I was helping the family, but, um, but at the end of the day, it was them that saved my life. And I never forgot that. But the kids, they, uh, and this is from that time when I got together uh, in preparation for Dim's wedding and they invited me to her wedding and all that they had me on a pedestal. Like they thought like, here's this nice guy. And, and, and if I never said anything, that's probably where it would have ended. Cause um, you know, and at the time there was a language barrier and stuff like that. The kids caught on pretty quick. Uh, but 
I never really expressed that. And, and, and so I took a chance and I started telling him a little bit about what, uh, and this is uh, Hang Lei and, and she works in Catholic healthcare. So it's kind of a neat story. But what happened was I took a chance to talk about my story thinking that it might forever ruin it. Like they'll think, yeah, this guy turned out to be, he was just some drug addict or whatever like that. And, but actually it didn't, it, I think we just grew deeper and, and then they shared stories that I never really understood. Like how did they actually come over from Vietnam? And they were kids at the time. And, and, you know, there was, they, they were just trying to make sense of that themselves. And, uh, Long story short is I said to them, like, somebody should tell that story one day. And and because uh, I'd never really seen a movie or read a book about so like the boat people crisis. And and so their story was very was a good story. There are a lot of people that got raped and murdered, you know, by Thai pirates on the high seas and all that. They, they survived it and did very, very well. But I ended up telling that story themselves in a in a fictional way and this is the downtown east side and that kind of was a a way of me remembering about um who I was and what that learning um uh, did for me and how it to this day fuels me uh in in being being prepared to step out for the sake of another and um and not turning my eyes away and but we really see and if you ever walk the downtown east side um uh as an example there are many east sides in all our communities and and in communities um but to not turn you away from the ravages of addiction the ravages of sex trade work whatever the case may be um but to be able to see that hurting vulnerable human beings and being able to see it because perhaps you yourself were a vulnerable hurting human being that true sense of compassion so i told a story and and this is a, a statement when we uh, unveiled a statue in the legislature grounds i know that you did a similar project in in saskatchewan and patrick damali our ceo you know made this comment and and you could probably read it quicker than i can say it so i won't repeat it here but basically, it was about saying yes, about what we commit to as a, as a Catholic ministry and being there present for people in need. What I want to kind of highlight here is professing words kind of commits us, especially in a public setting. And so there are times we kind of revisit those words and, and remember what we committed to, what we've said yes to, like those Norman Nacal moments and, and what we will always um, hold ourselves accountable to. So just for the interest of time, I just want to make sure I don't, you know, be, um, uh, go over, uh, overstay my time here. But if, if compassion is what moves us from a place of heart and courage is what gives us that ability to, to, to not just see, but to respond, but, and to, to, uh, embrace suffering then what is it that will sustain us and um and, and you know keep us resilient keep mission fresh in our lives and help us to maintain that mission fidelity so this is from the Sioux Harbor house and I uh it's a kind of a statue whatever and I always thought this would be a great image for like a like a, a, a cold cream commercial right like is your skin falling apart you know try this product. So, but I've always thought this is a wonderful picture because at times, you know, it may feel like that, maybe not physically, but we may feel like pieces of ourselves are sort of being torn apart, torn off of us or, you know, tough day at work or uh, a tough period of time like COVID um, can leave us pretty raw and, um, and bruised and battered. And so, um, you know, what is it that will keep us sort of um, intact and, and, and carry on and finding the strength within to continue our, you know, being resilient. And I would, I would distinguish re resiliency from balance. I, they're, they're very different in my mind. In fact, one day I was asked to give a, a talk to this women's health leadership pro, uh, session or whatever, this forum on balance. And I thought, 
holy Dina. I got to have a gigantic disclaimer in bold lights at the beginning. Like, first of all, I'm speaking to, to, um, to, to a lot of people, like to women who I you know, have tremendous respect for. And, and, um, and, and I think, what do I know about balance that, um, you know, in my own life, I wouldn't say I've ever been balanced. I struggle with that, you know, and, um, and so uh, at this conference, I talked a bit about um, what I put down here and quote here that it's not so much about trying to have eat our lives all in equal compartments and they're all perfectly in, in order and all that, but rather that there are times in our lives when we get stretched beyond, beyond all recognition and finding some way that we recover. And, um, and so this professor in my, in my, one of my university courses, once upon a time, he talked about, um, the psychologist talked about resiliency as the ability to summon forth positive emotions in difficult and stressful situations. And that resonates more with me where I, I often say, I got to give myself a talking to, I got to like, like summon and if you've ever been summoned like I was telling Blake just before the conference like last week I went to my daughter's boyfriend's bar call and um and and you know uh, so that was a pleasant experience being in court but if you've ever been summoned to a court appearance it's not like um you know uh, dear sir, madam, if you're not too busy next Tuesday and you wouldn't mind, it's not too much out of your way, would you mind coming down to the courthouse? That's not what summons is. It's like you must be there. And there's times where we have to kind of summon uh, in that same compelled way those emotions, that memory, that what we said yes to, what we've agreed to, that covenant that we made in our lives to our ministry uh, to bring forth uh, to this whatever stressful encounter that we're living. And I can tell you all through these last two years, I've had to do that a lot because it's been hard and you can forget. And, um, and so, you know, again, back to that oak tree or that old forest tree, you know, what, what is that we've been, you know, drawing forth the nutrients where we, where we've been rooted. And, and so that really speaks to the sense of spirituality Again, I'll try to maybe move through these last several slides here, but but whatever our spiritual life might look like, um, and whatever faith tradition that you belong, if at all, um, you know, we're all part of a ministry that recognizes and values the place of the soul and the spirit, um, and it's not just our patients and our residents or our families, but our staff and each of us as leaders within healthcare, you know, we need to, as the quote from Luke here says, find a way that we can, that we can um, let down our nets and, and draw deep um, to, uh, from within um, um, a, a sense of, of, uh, of strength, a sense of grace. And so the role of prayer in our lives and how important that is and the role of meditation, reflection, experience, whatever that might be, as a as an as a way of maintaining that sense of of uh, resilience. And when we could forget, you know, and we're so busy, you know, the demons of busyness, as it were, in healthcare, um, taking a moment each day and maybe throughout the day to to uh, remember, uh, you can't see it here and I'm not going to pull it off, but right below the screen in front of me, here's this prayer. And I look at it every day. And when I'm working from home, I have the, I have the same prayer there. And, um, and I begin my day always with that prayer. So the sisters, they build hospitals like there's no tomorrow, but they always began and end their day in prayer. They gathered in community and, and the sisters, it was never just about like, uh, you know, delivering health care. It was, you know, tending to the wounds. Yes, there was always a pragmatic dimension to their ministry, but it was also about building community and, and, and uh, building up faith in a community and helping people draw closer to God, not in a proselytizing way, just 
prompts to their own witness and to their own actions. And so I think for, at least I'll speak for myself, um, kind of remembering about uh, being in, in completing or, you know, a mission is a, is a, uh, uh, it's, it's more than just a noun, it's a verb, it's what we're called forth to in terms of a journey. But if it's only about buildings, if it's only about projects, if it's only about what we accomplish or another patient that we've served or another, you know, um, you know, initiative that we've completed, that rings hollow. It, it, it's got to be about something more. And, um, and again, I'm speaking for myself here, but invite your own reflections on that. But when I think about the, the Ministry of Healthcare, and as I near the end of my career, um, and looking back on it, um, there's tons of projects we've done, but it's going to be the relationships that I will forever bring forward with me and the relationships that where I've showed up and perhaps been present for a person or tried to and, and remembering the relationships of people who've been there for me. Um, and again, sometimes it may be you think it's uh, all what I've done for another. And I think that times that can sound a little bit of, you know, my own ego talking, but the story of the Leon family just reminds me about how in such amazing ways, how this ministry is such a gift and in many ways in which we've been touched or I've been touched. So uh, as I said, it can get beaten out of us. So uh, if you've ever done a personal mission statement, this is mine. I really uh, encourage you to do so. And if you do so, two things I suggest. Number one, date it and revisit it um, and, and see if it still makes sense years later. Um, and the other thing is like share it with people that you that you're close to, you know, like if you share your mission statement with your family member and your family says, hey, that's a great mission statement. Who is it? <laughs> you might want to, you know, maybe, you know, maybe give it a bit more thought. Um, but this is my mission statement and I'm not going to read it out here, but I can almost and I'm not a great I, I have a hard time remembering a lot of things. So but I can remember on a good day, I can almost quote this verbatim. I have it in my desk. I look at it a lot. And um, the one thing I'll highlight is that, you know, you can see in 2003, I was working doing a fellowship in Iowa at the time. And uh, it was long before I came here to Edmonton and long before we formed Covenant Health. But the values that I identified here, respect, justice, compassion, and integrity, are four of the six values that Covenant has espoused. And so when I think about a sense of fit in working for Covenant, you can, it, it really, I think um, it, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful fit because of that value alignment. And that's um, what I say yes to. So just to summarize, uh, I ask us to reflect on, you know, what inflames your heart and stirs compassion? What is it that's going to move you um, that you say yes to? And, and what roots you and strengthens you for courageous action? What, what will you draw from? Um, and again, not just about, um, about you, but for whom you are committed to serve. And, and what will sustain you and deepen your resilience uh, and deepen and, and um, foster a resilient spirit? Not just personally, but corporately in terms of your organization, your your, your hospital, your health center, uh, your care center, you know, what are, how will these elements show up? Where, where would you see them? Where would you expect to see them? How is it reflected in your decision-making? Can you see evidence of compassion, fortitude and courage and resiliency in the decisions that you make as a team, for example? And I'm gonna end with this final slide and, um, and it's just a sense of, um, because I talked about journey uh, from here to there, and, but also the interior journey. And um, journeys connote change for sure. But as that adage goes, wherever you go, there you are. There's also constancy. And, um, and so this image of the tide speaks to that, that dual dimension of permanence and change of um, of um, as in the, an old hymn that talks about abide with me fast falls the evening tide where you see both this abiding presence enduring presence 
but also a sense of transition and change. And, and I've been in healthcare for so long that I, when have we not talked about change? There's always change and there's going to be even more change. So change is part of our work. Uh, continuous quality improvement. We're, we're always going to be changing. But in the midst of all that, what is the one thing that still anchors us? What will anchor that anchors you? And, um, you know, so that we're not just flip flopping, that we don't lose our sense of identity, Catholic identity, or, or your own personal identity. What is the permanence? And, um, and however that might be expressed or understood, but I, I think that's important from an anchoring perspective. And so I end with that reminder, you know, again, a, a, a wonderful way of encapsulating this, what I tried to share in my, in my reflections this morning is the story of the Emmaus journey, where at times that, like Jesus, his disciples, they're bummed out, they've lost perspective, they, they can't even see Jesus coming up and walking next to them until at the moment of the breaking of the bread. But as they reflect on that later, they kind of recognize we're in our hearts burning with desire. And so sometimes we can forget because of just the demands and the ministry that we're part of. Um, but it won't, it, it hopefully won't take much in, in fellowship and in the breaking the bread when either sharing with another person or when we encounter brokenness, encounter the brokenness in another or the brokenness in ourselves, when we see Eucharist broken before us, that we recognize Christ and, um, and feel like that man on that summer night back in 83 or 82, 83, when I still feel the weight of his suffering on me, but also remembering what he taught me and, and what I have always committed to say yes. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude. And if there's time, Blake, I, I leave it to you to determine if there's opportunity for questions or comments. And uh, I'll just end my um, presentation, come back to this and hopefully it's 11 o'clock, so hopefully not too over time there, Blake. You're good. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Gordon. Um, uh, yeah, there's a few comments in the chat here. Thank you. I love hearing about how life is a journey. I've never thought of making my own mission statement. I will do this. Sounds like that could be a, an interesting workshop. I actually jotted that down for some of our managers and uh, staff for year end. But um, just while we're waiting for any further comments, I, I do want to thank you, Gordon. There was a few times as I was taking notes um there'd be times where i'd write something down and then come back to it so at first i'd written down this just this phrase this courage to do for others and then later on you came back to this idea of like you know that i connected which was this that compassion is the courage to do for others to take care of others uh to to open yourself up to that um and your line about what gets you up breaks your heart um Again, it tied in again with this idea of courage as the uh, compassion is the courage to do for others. It reminded me of that uh, Neil Young song, you know, only love will break your heart, that in many ways in Catholic healthcare and as affiliates, we can talk about uh, that idea of compassion and love together in terms of caring for other people. And uh, I use a lot of marriage analogies as well, so that, that how do you say yes to this every day? How do you say yes to this marriage every day? How do you say yes to this work every day? And I think you kind of painted a picture that when you ask that question of whose are we, um, you know, I think, you know, for some, sir, for some people from a Christian background, they might know, they might have a very clear permanent answer. But I think maybe over the course of a day and over the course of a week, at one point in time, we're our patient's person. And, and then at, after work, we're our own person. And when we get home, we're, you know, we're our spouse, we're our parent, you know. Um, so I think that speaks to almost the cycle of care for yourself, that you don't always have to be for other people. Sometimes you can be for yourself. Um, I really appreciated the Robin Hood story. Love the picture. Um, you probably could have beaten out Errol Flynn for uh, his role as Robin Hood. It was very, uh, so, so thank you for sharing your, uh, your stories there. For me, again, that image that came up when you were speaking, uh, connected to something I'd heard years ago, which is this idea that good ministry is is two-way. It's a cycle of helping each other. It's not just you helping them. That's that's just pure charity. But in good ministry, which we talk about healthcare as ministry, yes, we are caring for people who are sometimes fully unconscious, 
but they can give back to us as well. And sometimes if it's only in that sense of knowledge that what we're doing is, is good and right and, and, and holy, then that is enough. Um, and I really appreciated that last piece you were talking about, balance the ability to summon both positive emotions, um, summon forth positive emotions in difficult uh, situations. And that is what we're all called uh, to do in these difficult times. So um, thank you very much for all of that. Again, just lots of kudos in the side. Uh, I love this reflection, need to be tethered, but not fixated. Amen. Say, uh, same, so many good nuggets. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, Jesus in the bed, a thoughtful image, a helpful invitation. I appreciate that. And then just some thank yous and stuff. I'm just looking to see if there's any questions. But um, okay, it looks like we're, we're all right. You answered all the questions. Thank you very much, Gordon, again. Greatly appreciate your time and, and your offerings here. Uh, and looking forward to getting to know you better in the, uh, the leadership program there. Um, so folks, we do have one more presentation at two o'clock with Michelle Rourke. She has uh, given us a few of these books as prizes. We do have a few of these left. So if you'd like your name entered, you can just type it in the, uh, in the chat room uh, and she will have some of those for the two o'clock presentation as well. So have a very good day until then. Take care, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Thanks. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye now. Take good Bye -bye. care. Bye-bye. I see M, oh, there we go. I was just looking to see who wanted uh, their names entered and uh, I see they entered their names, so that's good, excellent. Take care folks, have a good day. We'll talk to you at 2 p.m.